people, and that's me. Yeah, you're, right? the, you're like, the one forcing everybody in. You guys know each other? Like, bah, <laughs> kiss. <laughs> right on. Uh, all right, man. Are well, you ready to get started? Let's do it. All right. Welcome back to Local Talent in Studio with us today, Eric Stopper. Eric, um, you want to give everybody the elevator pitch, who you are, what you do, and uh, who you do it to? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my my whole world is basically Amazon. Okay. So I founded a nanotechnology company in 2016, and we were doing, we had created a piezo-resistive nanocomposite strain gauge. So it's a, it's a stretchy sensor is, is like the basics of it. I got but, stretchy sensor. But we had put all these nickel nanostrands and nickel coated carbon fibers into the silicone substrate and we had figured out how to screen print it onto clothing. And what we were doing was we had created a belly band for pregnant women to track baby kicks in the third trimester. Yeah, it was, it was gnarly. Uh, we had a bunch of mechanical engineering support. We had like $3.6 million in National Science Foundation and uh, National Institute of Health funding. We were working on a DOD contract as well, but those are like a nightmare. So we were, we were doing this and my son was born with a traumatic brain injury, ironically enough. Oh man. So, uh, we were in the NICU and it was awful. They like, they called us and they said, Hey, you got to come say goodbye. Like the, the ventilator is on the full setting. If we turn it up anymore, his lungs will collapse. And we were like, Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, I guess, you know, I'm 24 at the time. And, uh, yeah, that the whole experience was just a nightmare. So we won all this pitch competition money. We, I think we we ended up taking home like fifty or sixty grand in like big checks mm-hmm. from all these competitions. And it finally came to the point where the stress was so much from what was happening with our son. Um, he ended up getting discharged. He's five now. Oh, that's awesome, man! And Congrats. he Congrats. is yeah, for real. Um, he is a miracle in every sense of the word. But I will I will mention that like. Early intervention works. When you know that your kid has an issue, sure. if you get them into the therapies, like the neuroplasticity of a child's brain is is something special, right? Like you can have them bounce back quite a bit. Um, we still have lots of challenges, but he is he's incredible. Yeah. Our little Grayson. So um, His name is Grayson? Mm-hmm. Man, that's... <laughs> Man, that's a hell of a way to come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's, it's been... That's an amazing story, it, It's man. been five years, and it, like, it's still... It haunts us, me and my wife. Um, it's made us very close, very sure. strong. Oh, well, yeah. Well, something like that, I would say it's either going to break you or it's going to... Statistically, so, it breaks you. So, you know, solidify your... The the divorce rates among uh, parents with special needs is something like 82%. So... I, I believe it. The, the, the uh, marriage is hard enough favorite. as it is. Right. Totally. <laughs> can't, well, can be. Yeah. So... I had a, a buddy named Ezra Roper uh, who was helping me through this whole entrepreneurial. Th- that was my first startup. That was the first thing I'd ever really done. I had done like a t-shirt brand and um, I had done like a little bit of uh, like marketing consulting for people, sure. but nothing serious. So Ezra introduced me to this guy named Thad who was running a uh, Amazon marketing agency called Nozani. Okay. So I joined Nozani as a salesperson. I was just selling agency marketing services to brands and it was, it was, it was great. It it was, the team was awesome. I made some, some of my greatest friends there. I learned a lot. I failed a lot and we just were connecting with brands Mm -hmm. every day, calling, you know, like burning the phones, 200, 300 calls a day. (sighs) And (laughs) it was, and it was, I was, I was good at it. Admittedly, like it was, it was something that really resonated with me to be able to call somebody up and say, Hey, like, I noticed you're selling on Amazon or you're not selling on Amazon, right? Um, but I, there's some things you're doing wrong. Yeah. Do you want to just talk about this and see how we can help? And the conversation just got easier and easier and easier. So that company uh, got acquired by another company called Buybox Experts. And then Buybox Experts got acquired by another company called Spreetail. So that's where it's at right now. Okay. When the transition from Buybox Experts to Spreetail happened, uh, like something like eight months before that, I did ayahuasca. And it was a lot. It, 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 it really it shook it shook me to my core. Really? Yeah. This was we we were up in Utah. We did it in Ogden. Uh, ten out of ten would recommend. Yeah. But also like with a guide. Oh yeah. A whole a whole, a whole shaman. Yeah. Don't do it alone. Don't do it for recreation. And it was funny walking into the ceremony, man. They were like, it, it was. I, I was. I didn't realize there was places like that in in the states. Everywhere. Oh, I'm sure we could find one ten minutes so, from here. For real. Oh yeah. Yeah. And there are varying levels of like professional shamanism that sure. are associated with it. 
and I made the mistake of only going one night. Our our babysitter uh, wasn't able to continue on for sure. the next day. And so I had to do the ceremony, wake up the next morning and leave. And the integration is really critical. And I didn't do it. You know, just you, you typically you, you do it the first night, you do it the next night. And then like the last, the third day at a minimum is like meditation and journaling and like talking with everybody in the community. I didn't do any of those things. So mm. came out of the experience and I was like broken. It really, I, I completely lost touch with reality. Kept looking at my wife. Like, I feel like I'm still in the trip. Like it was so vivid. You just live like a hundred lifetimes. And so do you think that you wouldn't feel like that if you did all three days? I don't know. Uh, people are typically, you know, you look at like, uh, like machine gun Kelly talking mm -hmm. about ayahuasca recently. He is changed. He's a different dude. Like you just, you look at how he's talking, you look at how he thinks about things and he, he, he changed for the better. You end up having people who they, they get back to their spouse and they're like, I don't love what, you anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I've experienced this thing like, and I got to be true to myself and they end up leaving. And so like, it's this very powerful, very scary experience. And you're completely like at the mercy of, of your mind and the universe. Like you're throwing up and like, yeah, yeah. and there's like, you hear people crying and moaning and throwing up. And well, and too, where you're at in your life, I could imagine is going to dictate how your journey is too, you know, yeah. if set, you know. set and setting, right. So if, if things are hard, you're going to like, you know, I re-experience the trauma of the NICU, re-experience the trauma of our son having like a hundred seizures a day for the first six months of his life. Like just feeling all those feelings and, and then like imagining every worst case scenario. And then a huge portion of it, you know, it's like, it's like six and a half hours long. Uh, you're just in this soup, this torrential soup of the mind and you, you're, it's just colors and sensations and you just like, you feel like you're going to be there forever. So it was, it was a lot. It was, it was a lot. Um, would I do it again? Well, coming out of the ceremony, everybody, uh, all my friends, my wife, they said, screw that. Like, you're not going back to that. You were a completely different person. So did your wife do it with you? No, no. So were you the only one that, so when you say the other people at the ceremony. There's 25 people there with so, shamans and helpers. So how many people were doing ayahuasca? 25, yeah. So, but your, so your wife wasn't. No. So but what, what I'm getting at is it sounded like your wife was there with you. So. No. No, it was just me. I showed up alone, dressed in white, having fasted for like a, or I had to, I had to like eat only, uh, you know, like potatoes and drink water for like a month. And then I had to be fasting when I got there. It was real. They were like, and it was, uh, I was like so surprised at how religious they were about it. I was like, you know, just give me the cup, you know, sure. like, let me dive in. And they were like, <laughs> no, no, hold this, on, bud. they were like, this is God. Yeah. Like you don't, you're not ready for this. So I took a large dose, which is a mistake, but it is what it is. Sure. So anyways, I'm at, I'm at buy box experts and I do the ayahuasca and like a month passes and the, the original guy who I talked to Thad, he was like, you, you're not in it. You're not into this. Like you're not here. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I was, I was a top performer hands down mm -hmm. had been for two and a half years, like, you know, doubled, tripled their business and was consistent, just closing deals. Ran a podcast for them as well called the Buy Box Experts Podcast with James Thompson um, and had a blast and it was fun. But then like it, it was time to it was time to transition. So they set me up so that I could move. I was living in Utah at the time in American Fork and uh, moved down here to Shirts, bought a house. Um, and during all this time right now, I'm deep in Amazon. I've been doing this for six years I sell my own products. Okay. That's my primary business is uh, I have a seller account, Turnstone Products. It's not a brand. It's just a seller. I have several brands under that, though. I service my own clients as well. Okay. So if, you know, somebody want, if somebody can't afford an agency, I, uh, you know, they, they basically hire me. Real quick. So what would somebody hire you for in, in terms of Amazon consulting? Yeah, totally. What, what, what would what would something like that look like? So, uh this is Audio Technica gear, or I, I guess our headphones are. So yeah, our, uh, Audio Technica is the headphones and uh, Roadcaster, and so Audio Technica has a marketing team, has a sales team, and they have their products listed online. They have their products listed on Amazon, and there's everything in this room is bought from Amazon. Totally, and that's and that's the idea. I think I have, I think I have these same uh, like blocks. Yeah, yeah. Um, the soundproof paneling and everything very familiar to me. So <laughs> all of these products rank somewhere on Amazon when you search for something. So if you, if you search for like soundproof panels, there's going to be a number one 
product on the page. Mm-hmm. Statistically, that bad boy, that number one spot gets 35% of the clicks. Sure. So it's this math game. So we help brands position their products to convert at a higher rate, right? So we make them look better. We put lifestyle photos in there to show like sure. smiling, people, sexy yep. people. Mm-hmm. Infographics with, uh, you know, custom details and features. And And how do they find you? Or do you find them? Dude, yeah. So I have an outbound team. They hit people up. Um, I've got warm leads coming from these from these companies and they want me to close them. Uh-huh. And then I have a LinkedIn that's popping. So people come to my LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I keep hearing, man. It's, it's a very consistent business. The agency world is hard, though, because... Not everybody is going to make your product slap. Not everybody's going to do it right. You could do all the best practices in the world, but not everybody's going to hit a you know a, a best selling album. True. So the attrition can be kind of high there, right? People leave, people get mad, at like, oh, like you. I expected. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to. You told me that I could make a hundred thousand dollars a month, and I'm like, well, you ran out of inventory. You know, there's all yeah. these, all these issues. So you were you were doing this, I guess, on the side. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well, so they. So there was some overlap, is what, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Well, I so I started <laughs> selling products on Amazon in like in 2018. That was mm-hmm. when I got my first product. It was a pair of earplugs called Pocket Plugs. Hashtag Go get freaking Pocket Plugs. They're great. <laughs> they 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 literally are like they attach to your glasses, mm-hmm. and and it's like a sheath for your earplugs. Like you can put them in this little like silicone sheath, and they slide over your glasses temple. So it's a really cool product. Um, and then like I've gotten into home decor and like. I've got a I've got a plant pot that's that slaps on Amazon right now and it just says don't be a cunt on it. And it's just this little succulent <laughs> plant pot and it's like the greatest thing ever. So I started selling those products and um became an expert at Amazon. Like I, I would consider myself absolutely an Amazon expert at this point. Do you work off of a a, a flat fee or do you also work in uh, some sort of commission or Yeah. Um, both. Okay. Both the flat fee is uh, is my favorite, mm-hmm. just because it's, it's reliable yeah. income. The commission deals kind of revolves around their product. I mean, bro, the commission deals are great because um, if I believe sure in what they're in what they're selling, then I can sell it. You know, and like it's mm-hmm. just math at that point. Especially if they commit to a minimum ad spend, like that's basically guaranteeing a retainer. Because if they say I'm willing to spend five thousand dollars in advertising, and I'll give you. 25% of my net proceeds, my profit from Amazon. If I get a 2x return on that, I can make them $10,000. Like, yeah. okay, we have a deal. We, yeah. yeah, so we do both. Grew up Mormon, went on a Mormon mission, and he was one of my like missionary companions. You know, we wore the the name tags and everything and knocked on doors. This is ironically also where I met my wife. We, bicycling. She, literally bicycling in like the freezing Missouri rain. Like mm. it was, it was, it was awesome. It was such a good experience. I made my, literally my best friends from there. And my wife was another missionary and like we connected after the mission. You did say you used to be Mormon. Yeah. Okay. You can't do ayahuasca and stay Mormon. It's impossible. <laughs> Tomorrow. Were you Mormon when you did ayahuasca? Barely, yeah. We, <laughs> Barely uh, hanging on. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, you know, COVID was happening at that time, and <clears throat> you could see this this shift happening, because we were in Utah, right? It's 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 culturally, like, most people are Mormon there. And, uh, there, like, the th- stuff that happened with our son and the, just the experiences that we had, um, there was a very specific one where we were teaching the six and seven year olds in, pr- in the primary class mm-hmm. in our, in our local congregation, they call them wards. So we were in our ward, we were teaching this class and like, we didn't believe what we were teaching these children. Mm. Right. So we just, we had to cut it. I went on the, like this journey basically for the next eight months, trying to figure out everything, talking to mentors, reading really deeply. Like I would consider myself a scriptorian read the, Did you start uh, feeling more and more disconnected. The more you started getting mentors dude, involved. It, and- it, well, it was like, <sighs> What I was expecting was I would talk to somebody and they'd be like, oh, like you need to just like have faith and stay the course. But everybody was like, no, you need to search your heart and decide like what, what it is that you truly believe. But, uh, during this time, you know, I'm like, I mean, I'm in Amazon marketing. Do I, do I love selling for these agencies? Do I love doing all this work? And I have no clue. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I feel like a leaf in the wind a lot of the time. Sure. And I got a lot of irons in the fire. So I, you know, part of, part of my, I would open up a conversation with somebody that owns a brand, right? I eventually get to, why are you doing this company? Because the owner of the company usually, why why are you doing this? Like, what are you, what are you, what are your goals here? I talk with these people. I'm like, what's the why? Why are Mm -hmm. you doing this? And they're like, well. I want to make money. Sure. Most of the time, you know, this I need this to be a profitable Don't like to venture. Starve. Yeah. And I go, well, how much money 
would you walk away for? Like, what would be the number that you say, I'm out, I'm cool, I'm, I'm selling my company. And for most people, it's way smaller than like their peers would probably guess. Sure. They're just like, yeah, I would walk away for a million bucks on this company. And I go, cool, we need to get you then to $250,000 in EBITDA, maybe even less than that, probably like $150,000 in EBITDA. And you can have that dream come true. Then we're talking about their their why, mm -hmm. their foundation. So that was my, you know, then they're like, let me give you all these reports. Like, here's the whole keys to the kingdom. Tell me how to get there. Like, sweet. Like, if we've done it for dozens of people. Let's do it for you. That conversation, coupled with the explosion of conversations in um, this aggregator, private equity, buying product company space, um, got us into the game. Mm -hmm. So I got a partner, Nathan, who he, we started a company called Kaizen. Mm -hmm. It's really like, it's mostly his baby. Like he threw me a bone. He said, I want you involved with this. So now I get to like talk with all these brands and do due diligence for them from a private equity standpoint. And it's fun. Yeah. It's very cool to like pop the hood and say like, Ooh, oh my man, like there's a lot of stuff that yeah. we got to fix in here. And a lot of people I say, hire the, hire the agency sure. and grow this a, lot, a little bit yeah they got more, a lot more resources a lot, yeah a little more fine and tuning for you but most people they're like Ugh, I've, been, I've been getting my ass kicked by covid for the last two years like i just want out yeah and they're willing to walk away for like smaller multiples than i expected most people probably think that you have to manufacture something to be able to sell a product so i'm sensing that's not the case with you i personally like to manufacture the product i don't make it and i don't set up my own warehouse to make it i have people in pakistan and mm -hmm. and sri lanka and china and here in the united states and mexico mexico dude is like that's the spot i like anything textile anything wood like mexico's the spot then the game starts and it's per product like how much money can i make how much do i need to spend on advertising and then at the end of like three months on that initial order was it worth it yeah. And then if it was worth it, I'll order 5,000. Sure. Right. That's so, yeah, I am in the manufacturing. And then so thing. whenever you're looking at Amazon, if you're a consumer and it says, hey, there's seven products left, it's usually because there's a, it's a, it's a fulf fulfillment by Amazon type of thing. Yeah. You've shipped 200 units. Right. You've sold so, through 193 of them. And by the way, Amazon, they take care of them and they're, they're, <clears throat> the product gets to Amazon and it's like, their inventory now they handle it they take care of it they they know how many you have left Dude, they yes. take you know see, so see no, like see no the, evil here like i don't want to i don't want to think about right. it right i mean I amazon I is a to, logistic company man totally <laughs> there, totally no, and it i mean you you look at the you look at the 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 logistics behind delivering like a a, a lip balm to somebody it could be in in tennessee mm -hmm. yesterday and it's here tomorrow and right it's spooky, man. They've it got is. it nailed down to a it science. It is. Well, and in, and furthermore, right, I, I've caught myself, you know, like especially you look around in this room, I've caught myself like I, I, I need um, an adapter of some sort, right? And then like I, I, I don't care about brands unless it's something really expensive. Then I'm like, okay, you know, trust a brand. Some, anyway, my point is, is like I'm looking at, oh, I can have this today versus tomorrow. I'm going to go with this one Today. here. I don't care how much it is. It's like five bucks more or 10 bucks more than the other one that can be here tomorrow. I'm getting this shit today. Yeah. And then I'm impatient waiting for it. Like, <laughs> bro, it's all it said between three and six. I bet it's going to be six o'clock. You do a lot of shopping on Amazon? Oh, yeah. How important are the reviews to you? Uh, summer dresses. That's the number one search term on Amazon over the last seven, uh, seven days. Yeah. It's, it, you know, like this one had two, it was like 2.7 stars and they were crushing it. They were doing like, $300,000 a month on a dress. Mm -hmm. And apparently it sucked, you know, it probably didn't fit very well. It had Chinese pricing or Chinese sizing on it. Yeah. So it ran a little bit small. There are some specific things like, um, uh, like I will buy a helmet because I have purchased that helmet before. I, I, okay. Look, this fits, this fits at this size. I'm going to go search Amazon for this thing at this size. Yeah. A little different. Um, pants, you know, if it is a a name brand, even, man, even that sometimes. Because, like, you know what I found is um, I used to wear Levi's for a long time. The, the, what I was finding was is that the my size uh, in Levi's made in Indonesia versus Mexico were very different. Super different. 
I mean, yeah. like, I not wearable different. You know what I mean? Not just Makes like, sense. oh, these are a little snug. But I mean, it's like they got the, the, the unit of measure should be the same. You know what I mean? But it, it's, it's well, drastically so, so different. So you ask how important reviews are. So mm-hmm. you think about your insight. If you were to leave a review and you said, hey, I noticed that when my this product is made in Mexico, it fits way better for me. Mm-hmm. The value that that provides to the person who's running that Amazon account mm-hmm. is absolutely priceless. Sure. You know, because then they know stop ordering from Indonesia, right? Like done, we're done with that or whatever it is for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, but I was going to say, but also, right, it, it, it lets the pot, potential consumer know, okay, this guy's got all these three-star reviews. Why? Mm. Well, the, the, the quality is good, but the sizing is small. Exactly. So then, so make oh, sure I'll just make sure I buy size bigger. Up. Yeah, and that's typically like when I meet somebody and, and we see that, because we have these tools that can show you like the frequency and sentiment of, of words in their reviews. It's really cool. It gives you like this bubble map. Wow. And you can see like, oh, it turns out that uh, the word cute appears in 36% of your reviews and you don't have cute in your title. Mm. You need to put cute in your title. Your click-through rate is going to go up. Your conversion rate is going to go up. It's little tiny changes like that right. that make the difference. Amazon optimization. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. For what you uh, your main hustle is? Yeah, that's the main hustle. Amazon optimization. Let's do the lightning round real quick. Pick a color of one of these four decks, and uh, I'm going to shuffle them. Hold on, hold on. Oh, yeah. You want the blue one? Yeah, let's do blue. All right, blue. I'm going to shuffle these up. And then... I'm going to ask you these questions. You answer them however you want to answer them. Let's see. Uh, what is the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Ooh. Uh, I've had Rocky Mountain oysters, which are, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, say. They're balls. Yeah, yeah they're testicles. Um, and was it good? No. No, the, the, the texture was, was strange, and they were cold, which was weird to me. Like cold a, balls. It cold seems balls. like they'd be warm. Yeah, I had cold. I, was, I figured they'd be warm, but no, they were, they were cold balls. Um, I had. Did they serve them? All, I I know what they are. I've never eaten them. But they I've had like seen a, it was like in a gravy, and then I had like mashed potatoes on the side and stuff. It was the it was the protein of the meal. Were they tough? No, they were soft. They're like, I mean, you imagine like biting like, into a, a, a slightly harder hard boiled egg, and maybe that's not the. I've, I've eaten tarantulas. I've eaten cicadas. Which by the hold way, hold on, you eating tarantulas and dude, that wasn't you, Rocky listen, Moore. Blue I mean, balls I mean the fr- they're, they're like, they're pretty close. <laughs> I think it's, it's subjective what, 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 at that was point. The tra- yeah, good point. Is the tra- was the tarantula out of survival needs? Or no. Is so, it just so the tarantula, we were at uh, Scout Ranch. So I was a Boy Scout growing up. I'm an Eagle Scout, right? On my honor. Um, and we were at, God, you know, I wish I could promote them because I can't remember. I think it was maybe Buffalo Trails Scout Ranch uh, out, in, out in West Texas. I think. But somebody said like, whoa, there's, tar- there's a tarantula over here. And I remember we walked out of our campsite and there was like a, there, there was this part in the road where there was a river that, you know, if it was real high, it would, it would flood the road. And we went down there with our flashlights and there were thousands of tarantulas just everywhere. And they weren't like the giant uh, bird eating ones. They were the, kind of the medium sized ones, probably like that big <laughs> legs and all. Right. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. And, um, you know, being a bunch of boys, like, we started skewering these tarantulas and oh this was not a delicacy this is just something you all decided to do yeah so then we, we skewered them and we went to the fire and we cooked them and they were delicious they were crispy how old were you uh, i was maybe 14 yeah and they were so good yeah and i remember them being good and I, we remember all like having a full belly after that and they, <laughs> and they they were like they were better than like mcdonald's chicken nuggets like they so were i'm gonna assume here y'all don't have any kind of seasoning or anything you just Raw tranches that you just, cooked them up. Just and the dirt and grime on our fingers, you know what I mean? What would you do if you were invisible for a day? I'd go down to the river walk, and I would try my best to, like, get people to connect. If, maybe that sounds kind of weird. Yeah, play Cupid a little bit. Here I am, this... Romantically or uh, just... I think, I think just both. Just, just you know, like, help, help people make friends. What's the most awkward thing that happens to you on a regular basis? specifically in what I do for a living, Mm -hmm. it happens every day is I'm trying to establish authority and trying to show somebody like, here's the difference between you and your competitor. Mm -hmm. And I like, I overlook something. I Mm. get, I get it wrong. I get their competitor wrong. I compare the wrong types of products together. They're like, it's not apples to apples. Oh, I lose a sale Mm -hmm. and it's like, 
oh, luckily now I'm good enough where I go, let's do one together. Just show me somebody who yeah. is the one. And then I can compare all the numbers and stuff and I can like recover from that. Sure. But like initially it's very like, oh, that's awkward. Yeah, <laughs> shoot, I look bad. What's the weirdest tradition your family has? Okay, so this is this is something that maybe happens. <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to tell this story. Um, so me and my brother, we have this, uh, we have this maybe every year, even every two years, we'll end up like drawing a picture at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it's usually like of each other, something happening. So the, the, the story that came to mind was, we were at my aunt, my aunt's house in uh, Pearsall, Texas, way down south, and uh, she was great. Sophie just passed away. And I really loved her, but um, here we are at her kitchen table, and we're and we're we're drawing a picture of each other, and then we were like, "All right, one, two, three, and we showed each other, and both of us had drawn a picture of the other person getting like dominated by a horse. <laughs> So like, so was it a horse then, ranch? So you're in Parasol? No, you're in, no, dude. She had like a bunch of cats in a better <laughs> garden. You know what I mean? She was just working for some telemarketing company. I don't know, dude. <laughs> that's no hilarious. context. It was impossible that that happened. But like, that's a that's a pretty common thing. Like, we'll we'll razz each other uh, and how draw many, pictures. Like, how that. many siblings do you have? I've got an older brother and an older sister. What is something that you hate but you wished that you loved? Uh, first thing that comes to mind is olives. Yeah, I will eat anything. You don't like olives, except for olives, dude. I went to Expo West in California. I love olives. Uh, showed up in Anna- Anaheim, and uh, and Expo West is the Natural Foods Expo. There was an entire row of olives with palate cleansers in between, and drinks, and all this stuff. All these olive vendors from all over the world: Israel, freaking Afghanistan. They got local growers. Olives, olives, olives. I was like, dude. Everybody in my whole life loves olives. I'm going to I'm going to get to the bottom of this and I'm going to try every olive that there is and I almost threw up for like an hour. It was so awful. Couldn't find one you liked. Dude, I wish I loved olives. Really? Just man. The thing that I am the most excited about right now is this is this uh YouTube personal influencer brand world of like interacting with uh mental health in a from a sales perspective. Okay. That's like just this thing that I want to talk about and I want to, right. I want to like explore and I want sure. to be challenged and I want to be wrong and I want to be right. You know, like it's just, I, I, I think about waking up and talking about that with people traveling to a, you know, sales team of 500 people at an organization and being like, guys, let's meditate. Sure. Like let's, let let's set a, a, a pattern for you every time before you get on a call. What do you do to prep for the call? Mm-hmm. How do you like mentally and emotionally set your, your mind to have the highest chance of success because I know that not everybody does it. Right. Very few people even well, stand they, like a superhero. Right. right. Well, no, I, I mean, well, especially, <clears throat> so especially in sales, right? Cause sales, like you said, you know, conversion, most conversions are 25%, let's say 30. So you get 70%. So, you know, the, the quick, easy way to get around that is more numbers. You know what I mean? You know, more calls that 30% of, a uh, thousand calls versus a hundred calls is going to be more lucrative, of course. So if you, you know, <clears throat> if you can work out a system so that, you know, that one, that number goes up and two, uh, I, I, cause I, I feel like what you were saying a minute ago about, you know, you get off the call, you get off, the, it's a loss. You know, I think at the end of the day that tallies up because it's not 30% every day that you're winning. It could be this month, was all 70%, you know, and out of the course of a year, you're doing 70, 30, but this month sucked. Yeah. And then, so at the end of that month, it's just like, I'm getting my teeth kicked in. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I'm, I'm not going to get paid right. as much. I'm worried about my bills, dude. Like for any sales uh, leader in an organization who has a lower performer on mm-hmm. their team in a month, mm-hmm. that person. Oh, let's talk about stress. huh? Is a, is a, is a danger to themselves at that point, like end of the month, they didn't get, they didn't hit their quota. Mm-hmm. If you go and you talk to them about like, yeah, hey, you know, like, hey, Bob. you know, <laughs> things aren't really going so well. Like, what are you going to do? Like what you probably should do is go to them and say, Hey, I noticed that you had a lot of, um, discovery calls. You did really good at getting a lot of discovery calls this month. How, wh- why did this go right? Why was, why was this so good? Mm-hmm. You seem to like crush it. Like you did a great job. Why? 
Talk to me about it. Get them, get them to open up. Okay. Because I was losing so many of these well, deals. Well then, well, then you say, <laughs> well, then you, then you say, well, okay, well, how do we transfer those wins over to this other side? Sure. Instead of saying like, you're not yeah. doing so well, you know, like, what do we need to change here? You get them to, to view it in a positive light. What did you actually do well? And then how do we transfer that over to the things that actually like convert? Is there a part of the process that you're missing? Are you not sending enough contracts? Oh yeah, you didn't send enough contracts. Are you afraid to send contracts to people? Is that something that like is a tough conversation for you? Let's like, let's help figure that out. Let me, let me guide you. And then, and then bro, <laughs> take a deep breath, take another one. And then just telling them like, this doesn't matter. It matters. It matters a lot, right? Like here we are in a working relationship, but yeah, grand scheme of things. At the end of the day, dude, like you are this beautiful, creative human being, and I know this is not your passion mm -hmm. by any means, but like you are way more than a crappy sales month. Just like getting every sales professional to just talk to their team about that kind of stuff, man. Like that's the way that I think I'm going to change the world. Okay. So that's. Exciting thing number one in entrepreneurship for, for me right now. Exciting thing number two. Okay, this is, the, this is the thing that like I cannot stop thinking about it every single day. Um, I had a dream three months ago mm -hmm. that I owned a crematorium. Mm. Okay. And uh, maybe it was because we were watching too much Ozark. Ozark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, we were, we were watching Wendy freaking burn bodies, right, from, from, her, from her body count. But... Uh, I had a dream that I owned a crematorium. What and they're doing wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do I optimize this yeah. process and not get killed by the, by the mafia? Um, so I had this dream, and in the dream, I was taking the, the ashes, and I was compressing them into diamonds. Mm -hmm. And I was taking those diamonds, and I was setting them into beautiful, handcrafted, legendary heirloom artifacts for people's families. So you imagine like, like Thor's hammer mm -hmm. and on the side of the hammer, you have an engraved tree or something or like a family crest. And in the crest is the diamond of the deceased person. Mm -hmm. We are now making shields and swords and we have a lightsaber. Dude is the cool. It's like it's marble and walnut wood and it's got, you know, like you can attach the lightsaber and it's got a light and it's got the, all the electronics in it and the, and the stone, the Kylax crystal inside of the lightsaber is a glass, uh, crystal that is made out of, you know, parts sand and the other materials used to make glass and this person's ashes. So you literally have a lightsaber where the power element inside of the mm -hmm, lightsaber mm -hmm. is the deceased, your deceased family member. So it's called legendaryitems.com. Hold on. You started this off with you had a dream. <laughs> and and I made it real. So now we have I have a bunch of craftsmen who are making this for me. I've got these deals with these machines that can make these diamonds. Like it's it's a real process. So oh these fucking guys. Um okay. We can pause if you want and just No, pick no, up I, I'm I'm it won't pick it up. Uh, um How much of, okay, you're, you're calling it a diamond. It's a diamond. How much of this diamond has DNA from the dead person? So what, what they do the is, deceased. so there's a, yeah, is there political correctness yeah, around? Shit, man. I, people die. It's okay. Right. Um, so they take the, they take the ashes and what they're doing is extracting the carbon from it. So that the ashes have zero DNA. I mean, there might be a bone in there. Or something but like it's carbon that's right. all it is you've you've burned it you've reduced it down to something else entropy has taken over and now it's just ash um those ashes happen to be special because they came from somebody that you used to love but at the end of the day they don't they don't really carry any dna especially after this process so there's a process of um chemically taking the carbon from the ashes and it we take everything else out and you're left with pure carbon that you then put into this machine. And it's a really cool machine. Like it's got these like six compression elements to it that like every minute they, they compress a little bit more and they've got heat in the center of it. So I don't know, like a hundred percent of it is their soul, but um, 
Well, Zero percent of it is their actual like deoxyribonucleic acid. You know what I mean? It's not the it's not the proteins anymore. It's just carbon. So pessimist to me says, how do I know that my mom's really in that diamond? Well, you, I mean, you send it over and you, you see. And do you use all of the ashes or just some of them? Two tablespoons, man. That's all it takes. Okay. Yeah. If you want a bigger diamond, it takes longer (laughs) and you could put like a cup in there, but you send it in. And there's a bunch of companies that are doing this. There's a, there's a group in, I think Canada called Lawnite, um, Everly, something, Eternova. The the name of your business that you're doing this with, say it again. Where do you, how do you get there? Legendaryitems.com. Legendaryitems.com. It's live. You can do it. Um, I work with a lot of estate planners too. So if you have an estate lawyer, like they're the ones that are going to end up sure, yeah, putting you into a dime and making sure the process goes through. Or like if, if you are the estate owner, right? The, the kid who gets the, the ashes mm-hmm. and you have like, you know, 20, $50,000, whatever that gets paid out from their life insurance policy. You can then use a portion of that to, to craft this item. So um, the diamond is one part of it, and then whatever you're putting this in is the other. Yeah. You know, um, what, uh, what, what, where's the expense? Would it be the diamond part of it? It's both, yeah. So um, depending is, on... The, is there an average price for something like this? Yeah, yeah, about $7,000. So out of that seven grand, it's about roughly half to make the diamond and half to make the... Yeah, yeah. Whatever it's being put into. Yeah, so, but if you like... You know, if if you want a shield done, how big a, is a shield? A wooden shield. It's a big shield. It's okay, like you can like use it legit, in battle, and it's yeah, real. Yeah. Okay. So it's hand carved. It's got these like special rivets in it that make it look really super sleek. Um, and I'm not the one that's making this, right? There's a there's a very good craftsman that I go to that I found on Etsy who's like the guy, and he's just like great. And I say, I'm like, dude, money's no object. Like, make me something amazing. Um, so they, you know, they they make this, and it, you know, like he. He probably charges five hundred dollars normally on on his website mm-hmm. to make like a run of the mill shield, but if we're going like custom gold encrusted, you know, like pieces of marble actually embedded into it, jewels embedded into it, a story engraved on the whole outside of the shield, like that thing starts to get sure. really expensive. Yeah. It's super custom. So the most expensive item that we've made so far, so we've got a couple of these under our belt now, is a um, it's this giant like. Um, I guess you call it a pole arm. There's a, there's a specific, there's like a, it's a, it's a Chinese product. Like okay. it's a, it's this big, long staff spear with a giant blade on the very top of it. Okay. And along the, the whole body of the spear is the story of this person's life wow. engraved into it. That's and then at, awesome. at the very end of the, of the spear is the, is the, it's, it's actually a crystal. They didn't opt for the diamond. They just like a glass yeah. crystal. And it's beautiful and like gold and it's got like this brown tint to it. Who puts the story together? Uh, right now it's me and uh, a videographer that I uh, found in the Philippines. <laughs> yeah, it's... I'm, no, down the staff. Oh, the engraving yeah, of yeah, the yeah. staff. I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a craftsman. Well, no, 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 no. I'm me. saying like, where does that story come from? Does the family put this Persons together or is it we do ideally it. would it be the, 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 the deceased before? Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's two kids. I haven't done the situation where the, the deceased tells their story before they die. I haven't sure. done that situation. It's, it's always been from the family. So they tell me about this person's life. And then like we, we make videos and they're all in production, right? I launched this company two weeks ago. So we've only, we've only made three products to date. Okay. And they're amazing. They're like beautiful. But so there's a video that goes along with this? There's a video that goes along. That's part of the, the, the okay. deliverable. So we do an interview with the family. Uh-huh. Typically, like whoever wants to be involved, they come in, they tell their story. We usually get their favorite song. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what was the, what was the, and we, and we put the story to that song. So I've got a licensing lawyer that's like helping me out with all this stuff. Sure. At the end of the day, if it doesn't make money, there's anyways. So yeah. um, there's a video that goes with the production of the item. Right, so you could just, just actually it see it get created. You get to see the carving of the story of this person's life, and then there's the actual like, just storytelling behind it. And those two things are overlaid. So you got one part interview, one part craft, and it's usually like a ten minute video, and they are incredible. They're not they're not done. Right. They, they take. They, you know, it's probably going to take a month to produce one of them, but we've got all the raw footage for these, and they look. They look badass. That They're is, that's cool. awesome. And so like in my head, right, I'm sitting here thinking about the possibilities of something like this. I mean, your creativity is your only, you know, bound um, uh, or limit. The, um, uh, the, uh, 
So I'm, I'm I, in my head. I'm seeing that staff that you were just talking about that you were just describing, right? And I can see it enshrined somewhere in the case on the wall or whatever. And then, only because this is where we're at in technology, <clears throat> a QR code that you could snap and then watch the video of it being made. So right now I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, so this is uh, I. Diamond manufacturers are very, very innovative people. They have been, you know, doing all kinds of stuff for all kinds of years, like how to, how to get new how to get new colors out of diamonds and stuff like that. So um, we're working on micro engraving QR codes, and the, so we want the person's name on the diamond sure, because sure. you can imagine if you have like a whole family heirloom, literally like when I die, I pass this to you, and my diamond gets encrusted into a part of this thing, like it's something that gets handed down forever. So eventually you just have diamonds filling this priceless artifact that somebody in your family gets. Um, well, and then too, right, just to spitball here, the, um, you know, you could have a product where it's the father and the, and the mother, right? Right. And so then let's say it's a staff just because that's what you said earlier. Um, then this is passed down, right? And it, let's say it's a complete deal, their story, each of their stories on whatever, and then they come together somewhere and then the finish, right? And then so the children... Right, they all have their mother, father's, you know, whatever. I mean, you could have a wall of these things, like a family tree. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, and I, I mean, eventually, what I want to get into is imagine that you had a um, a custom guitar mm -hmm. with all of the diamonds of the Rolling Stones in that guitar into the into the bridge of it. Mm -hmm. Priceless, yeah. literally priceless, right? Like who gets that? Who gets it? They have to commission. They have to figure out how, like, I want to do that. That sounds like so much fun. And you know, like I think part of the reason for the obsession with this is just this. I've, I've been, I've been immersed in death, just thinking about death for the last couple of years, imagining mortality, trying to understand my. Has this been after the ayahuasca trip? Yeah. You've been immersed in death. Yeah. I just, you know, because you've got Pascal's gamble, right? Like, either you believe in God or you don't, and he's either real or he's not. And in that matrix, right, if, if you believe in God and he's real, woohoo, good mm -hmm. job. If you believe in God and he's not real, like, what a waste of time. If you don't believe in God and he's real, you fucked. Consequences, right? And if you don't, if you don't believe in God and he wasn't real, great. Like that's where I, that's kind of where I'm at. That's my gamble. Right. So thinking about all this, you know, I have to think, oh, like I'm gonna die one day. What do I actually believe is going to happen to me, and does that matter? So just being so close to this, I've been asking a lot of people, "What do you think happens when you die?" Mm -hmm. And so, what's as, the over? Is there an? Uh, what's the common answer? Is there one? Um, you know, I, I've been surprised that people say, "I don't care." Yeah, that's been, that's been the most common one. Is like, I don't, I don't know. I've thought about it a little bit, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's been. Uh, kind of so, it's sobering for me because so obsessed with this idea and talking about it. And then like, it turns out a lot of people are just kind of laissez faire about it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to die. Like I get it. They've accepted it. And sure. you know, maybe at the end they're a little more concerned about it, but in this moment they're just focused on like paying their mortgage and stuff. So the, the, the question that I've been asking people more lately is what would you want to be turned into? You know, like what do you want your diamond and great, you know, embedded yep. into and uh, people are so creative, dude. There's just like all kinds of stuff. Um, some people, <laughs> they they go for like weapons, beautiful weapons. Like I'm a I'm a big video game nerd, so mm -hmm. like you have this never ending corpus of reference material to make virtually any type of ornate sword or axe that you could ever dream of. Mm -hmm. So most people say like a big axe or. Uh, one of the items that were that is being crafted right now is a it's like a 1920s uh, double under shotgun, mm. and we have figured out how to do like a marbleized metal texture on the barrel, so it, it actually looks like marble. It's like white, but it's still metal. The thing's fully functioning. The whole thing's gold encrusted. The um, the switch on the and like all the all the actual like trigger and everything. Mm -hmm is gold encrusted and has a story in it it's, it's it's incredible and then the butt of the gun has a hand carved view of a cowboy and his dog on a starry night and the star the biggest star in the sky is the diamond, diamond. nice it's magnificent it is truly 
le- legendary. You know what I mean? And and that's kind of where the idea for the name came from is you, um, like I played a lot of World of Warcraft when I was a kid. Yeah. And there are legendary items that you can acquire in those games, right? And they're usually like gold and they have all these special attributes and like you hold them up and they're this like, they're this brag, you know, you got bragging rights if you've got them. And so that's what I imagine is like, instead of having an urn full of ashes on your, on your mantelpiece, like there's grandpa's rifle with his diamond embedded into it. Yeah. And that's, that's more impactful. Totally. A lot more easier to look at than an urn. Definitely. Yeah. I think urns are kind of, I mean, they're cool, but well, yeah, there's, I worry about there's tipping nice them ones, over too. Well, they're a liability. Yeah. So my brother's um, mom is in an urn. Uh, my mom was cremated as well. And so it, it, the before this had happened to us, I say my brother, my half brother. Yeah. So before this had happened to this part of our, our lives, right? The idea of having an urn with somebody's ashes in it in your house was like, no, this is not going to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it kind of just happened, and then it's like, oh, this isn't that bad, but still, it's an urn. You know what I mean? I mean, it's it's nice. It's yeah. But it's like you get sad when you look at it instead of if you're looking at Grandpa's gun. You would, I would say, feel more excited. And you can or, get it down and handle it. And like these are these are weapons. Right. Like if somebody were to break into your house yeah. and you have that big pole, grandpa arm, gonna kick your ass. Grandpa is going to <laughs> wax that ass. You know what I mean? Like what an opportunity. Yeah. Nice, <laughs> <clears throat> dude. I'm gonna get the one thing you wish you knew before start being an entrepreneur, before actually becoming an entrepreneur. What do you wish you would have known? I wish I would have had a uh, a mentor. Yeah. Somebody that was like expert that I could just show up every week and ask them questions and talk to them. Cause I'm a student of YouTube. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, like that, that's the, that's the thing that, that taught me. And I wish that I had a human being to interact with. who was living the life that I wanted to live that, so I could see it and hear it and taste it and smell it and understand what their day to day looks like and see how to optimize my schedule and like see where I might've been going wrong and see where my biases might've been standing in the way of, of my success. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and just, Throwing my feet at the, you know, to throw myself at the feet of the master. I really sure. wish that I had a solid mentor when I got started. What's the biggest mistake you've made as an entrepreneur? I have this tendency to start things, and then they'll like sit there for mm. a little bit. Mm. And so I make the mistake all the time, and it's the thing that I'm working on the most. Is like most people struggle with starting. I struggle with getting distracted. Yeah, same. And so, you know, one of the values now that I've, that I've established is finishing Mm -hmm. is I, whenever, whenever I start a product, I, I need to, I need to pick up a point where it's, I can say that it's done. It's that project. My, my idea of that project is finished. And typically that is positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. And if it's, and if, if it's a, a passive income stream, great. It's set up. It's good forever. If it's a business that needs like hands in it, there's an operator that I've installed into it that, mm-hmm. that is running it for me, my first employee on whatever project it is. And there's a system for them to like give me feedback and help me, you know, like make optimize decisions. the business yeah. and mm-hmm. make decisions. Yeah, exactly like that. So I, I would say, um, yeah, making sure that I, that I, that I did that and that I do that. That's yeah. Getting, I, getting it started is an issue for me. It's like, you know, uh, I, I feel, I honestly feel like I could probably make anything work. I could probably make anything profitable, anything. My problem is just, you know, oh, this this thing over here is shiny and new, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm like, my printing business versus my drafting business. My drafting business, it takes a lot less moving parts to make a buck than it does my printing business. Less overhead, materials, you know what I mean? And my printing business at the at, at when I started, it was so much more fun. It was new. It was, I, I like to actually make shit. You know what I mean? So I was like, it was filling a lot of things. Right. Uh, I come to find that I didn't really like uh, customers very much, but, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I just feel like I could probably make anything profitable. I would just, I lose interest really easily Yeah. But when it's not going, ex- I don't even say exactly, but when it's, when it's st- things start going awry and you've got something else that, that, that is fulfilling, more fulfilling than it's just like, all right, what do I do with all this shit over here? You know, anyway. <clears throat> best advice you ever received. The guy who got me into the Amazon uh, agency, Ezra, 
right? He referred me to Thad and mm-hmm. is, a, is a whole thing. Respect the hell out of this guy. And when I, when I watched him, when I watched him work, when I want, when I listened to him talk about the things that he was doing, it was like, um, okay, well I, I have an Amazon agency and I have a fulfillment company mm-hmm. and I have a manufacturing company and I have a sourcing company and I have a Google SEO company and I have a, um, home delivery and I have a logistic, like every time that he ever had to go and get something to like hire somebody, he would just go, I could do this. And he would just, and he would just set it up. He would just make the business. So I watched that happen over these years, all these mini businesses. And I thought, dude, there's no way that you're able to operate all these, all these companies effectively. And it turned out that no, of course he wasn't like it, it, not, not perfect at all of them, but you know, out of, 15 businesses that you own doing all variety of things. If you know, five, even five of them are running halfway decent, like you're, you're in the green and you're good to go. And so, um, then finally, like I talked to them about how to do it really. Like, what do you, how do you, how do you make this work? How do you do so many things? And he just goes, well, um, every single company that you set up has a system that needs to run. Mm Mm-hmm. And yep. you got to figure out what that system is, set it up, and and then you're golden. Just let it let it go. Deciding what that system is, figuring out what that is, um, is is typically one of the hardest parts yep. when you're like an ADHD entrepreneur. Just knowing that, like, okay, this piece needs to go to this piece, and this piece needs to go to this piece. That's how we make the money. Also, I'm going to interject. Uh, setting up that process that that operates without your involvement. Yeah. That you That's can a step big away from it. challenge for, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, Yeah, uh, you know? And so, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, that sounds obvious, but I mean, you know, if, if you can't, st- and I read somewhere some once upon a time, you know, it, 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 depending on how far, how long you can stay away from your business and it's still running, it's kind of a scale of how much you just have a, a job versus a business. You know what I mean? Totally. So, um, setting up those process entrepreneurs, uh, you know, nobody can do it as good as best as fast. Like I was saying earlier, but the, you know, there's so many problems with that because, you know, if you're not setting something up with yourself removed, you're setting yourself up for failure. You can never get away. You're always going to be shackled to whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. What's your favorite tool? So Helium 10 is a, is a data analytics software. I worked for their largest competitor selling their enterprise software for a little while called Jungle Scout. Um, and then Zonguru does something very similar. Right now I'm comparing all three of them, like sure. mm-hmm. really apples to apples. But the user interface of Helium 10 is the best for what I need to do in all of, all of my Amazon related businesses. And it basically, all, all it does is it takes the um, back end and front end data that you can scrape from Amazon and it puts it in a format that you can view the data. So only Amazon, Google, it only YouTube. does, well, it does Walmart too, I think, but I don't really mess with that. This is just Amazon, Amazon. Okay. and it, sell, it tells me how many keywords this, this competitor is showing up for, what the search volume for those keywords are. Is it going up or going down? What the organic rank for that keyword is for that, that listing that I'm looking at. And all of that allows me to say, okay, like you have, 50 keywords in the number one position and your competitor has 200 keywords in the first position and that gets them 500,000 yeah, more impressions cool. than you at a 35% click through rate and an 8% conversion rate at a $25 price point. Like this is your missed opportunity yeah. that like that's all I use. How do you reset? How do you uh, unplug? How do you relax? When a sales call goes poorly, mm-hmm. go for a walk. That's like any length of time. No, no, I could go around the block. I could go around the neighborhood. There's just a hill un- nearby. Just until you feel better. It's honestly just about getting away from the computer and going outside the house. Where do you see your business in 10 years? So uh, with legendary items specifically, that's the one that I'm the most excited about, right? Um, I hope that I uh, get like Michael Jackson's ashes and I can put them into a glove or something crazy like that. Like I hope to be working with um, the most famous people in the space. Um, I hope to have sold several Amazon businesses by that point and be done with, with, Amazon. with Amazon. From the time that I was six, I've wanted to be a senator here in Texas. So in S- most six year olds don't know what senators are. I had met one at some convention and I thought that's, that's that, where I want to be. I feel 
good around this person and that person has a certain type of like power that direct feel i feel like i can direct some change a state senator or a state senator, senator for the for the for the federal government or on the state level state senator yeah um i don't think that those uh, i don't think the federal level should be as involved as they are in state politics you know what i mean so like state you know keep, yeah. keep it up keep it apart talk about getting into the, the lion's den or you know like a cesspool it just seems like that vibration and energy is not it would be counterintuitive me, to what let, you and I have talked about so far. Let me tell you where I'm coming from on this, okay? Bitcoin cryptocurrency has now made voting uh, digitally possible. Okay. The The concern all of these years is that like, oh, like what if my vote gets counted weirdly? Or like, what if someone hacks me? Playing field is leveled. If I can, if I can shatter my digital vote into billions of pieces all over the internet, then I know it's safe. Awesome. I can summon my vote as an individual, true individual representative democracy. Me representing myself and voting on any number of things is officially possible. And so... Not corruptible. Not corruptible. Is, is, that's what you're getting at. Re Republican democracy, we've seen it's broken. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, the, the freaking Supreme Court sided with Ted Cruz about like f campaign finance being a protected free speech. Like that's corruption. Everybody can look at that and go, what the heck? No, that's not okay. So well, yeah, I mean the, all the hit, birds of the same feather. So it's, it's not like everybody, you know, I think maybe everybody votes for the president. Maybe everybody votes for Supreme court justices and like, and let free speech reign. You know, people can be convinced one way or the other, but what you do, the, the the platform that I want to run on is statistical democracy. That's that's what I'm shooting for because if I interview 300 people and I give them, or if I just ask them on a five point scale what they want about something, and there's very specifically on a scale of, of you know one to five, how important is this to you? And then what you know here here is the proposed uh, solution to it. How much do you agree that this is the solution that we should use, right? There's a couple of different iterations that I'm thinking through on this, but if I ask 300 people that and they're geographically and demographically diverse, then I have a statistical curve that I'm going to have sure. around that decision. And then we know if, let's say that we still have representatives who are supposed to actually implement the laws and make, and make things happen. Well, if they don't align with that statistical curve, mm -hmm. they're fucking out. Yeah. Screw that person, right? Like they do not actually represent the majority of people. And, and it's statistically, at that everyone's going to be within one standard. Sixty-eight percent of everybody's going to be within one standard deviation of the curve. Mm -hmm. So if we can, if we can make the system where everybody can vote, and it just randomly polls everybody on certain issues, mm -hmm. and you don't get to vote on all of it, you don't get to vote on an yeah. entire piece of legislation, you get to vote. On a piece sentence. of it, you get to vote on, you know, whether or not we remove a speed bump or wh whether we put a speed bump in. You get to vote on whether or not there's a there's a uh, a traffic light put in at a certain stop. How the how the budget gets allocated, if a bonus gets put in, because like there's enough people where you only need a couple hundred of them to be able to vote on something in a certain time period, and like you can have people talk to them about like why they should vote a certain way. Sure, whatever. Like let let it just be free. But then like you truly get decisions made from from a from a democracy from like the people so that's that's the theory that's kind of what i'm what i'm going towards and so you know screw all the politi the political stuff like all all the politics are very polarized dude yeah. all of us are right here in the middle just trying to vibe right trying to like make good decisions and like have an infrastructure that actually works for us and if we can get a system that actually represents that then i think that we can move towards something that's pretty utopian yeah it'll be broken there's sure. plenty of issues that'll be that'll be running into but um things can always be better i think that's the next evolution of politics so i don't know kind of I, I know you're i know you got I, you, I, I i could do that i could hang out here with you all day but I, I know you got i know you got things to do so um yeah man i appreciate you coming in this yeah. was a blast yeah. I, I hope we can do this i, I hope we can finish invite me back i'd love to come <laughs> all right man